Um, wow, that is a bright light. Uh, DEF CON, 20, or 20 years. Um, so I've been at about eight of the cons uh, and it has been pretty incredible to see how things have changed over there. I'm actually quite surprised that so many of you are here today because Jeff's um, over talking in one of the other rooms. I figured that he would suck all the energy out of this room. So I hope I have uh, something mildly interesting to say. Back in uh, 1999 I was still in the Navy and DEF CON was still kind of a scary place for uh, government and, and Navy guys to go. Um, but one of my guys, um, Sean Murphy, Sean, you're not out there, are you? He uh, said, hey, you know, we got to go out there. I think there'd be something cool to do for uh, the Navy to go show the flag. And uh, so we talked to the skipper and, and convinced him to let us uh, send two people out here. But because we wanted to kind of be incognito, he had to give us special permission. So I had two guys that actually grew their hair out and grew beards. Um, for, uh, for about two months, which was pretty unusual. Um, and, you know, they were always getting stopped and saying, hey, sailor, you need a haircut. And uh, so anyway, it was kind of interesting back then. Um, Jeff's not here, but, you know, this is pretty cool uh, that, that we've been able, that DEF CON has been able to be around this long. You know, some people in the room here today probably weren't even born at the first DEF CON 20 years ago. Um, and if you've never heard the genesis of DEF CON, how it actually started, you, you need to go buy Jeff a beer sometime and have him walk through it. But I'm going to walk through it really quickly here uh, at a very high level. Jeff was living in Seattle at the time. He was living with a, uh, a music producer that was uh, producing hip hop music. And uh, it was, I guess, kind of lame, but on the hip hop scene back then, if something was cool, it was deaf. And uh, I know that's pretty lame. Uh, but, uh, and, and during the 90s, phone freaking was still the rage. Uh, you know, and, and getting uh, free access was, um, was what it was all about. And if you go back and you look at the number three key on your phone, it's D-E-F, death. So, um, but what really sealed it for Jeff, the name DEF CON, uh, at, actually the, the, the movie, it was a movie, um, War Games. And while War Games had come out a few years earlier than that, <coughs> um, in, in the movie, Matthew Broderick, he hacks the Whopper computer. Anybody know what Whopper, remember what Whopper stands for? Somebody does. Has anybody seen the movie? <laughs> um, anyway, Whopper, he hacks Whopper and starts playing a game called Global Thermo Thermonuclear War. And when they ask him, he says, what are the targets you want to enter into here? He puts in Seattle and Las Vegas. So he was living in Seattle at the time and he wanted to hold the con in Las Vegas so it was like, you know, there's more to this. So anyway, that's how DEF CON was born. Um, so here we are 20 years later uh, and I think that's a testament to the staying power of our community and the significance of what, uh, what our community, what the secur security community has, uh, has grown to over the years. In the early days, um, even, you know, think about this, back in 1992, computers were um, still pretty expensive. Not everybody had one, not like today, you know, when some of us have two or three or four or even a server farm in, our, uh, in a closet at home. But the most important thing was there was no such thing as free internet access back then. I mean, there was no, there was no Wi-Fi. And when we think about it now, I mean, we go someplace and there's no free Wi-Fi, it's kind of like, what's going on here? No free Wi-Fi. I mean, I still get hacked off when I go into a hotel and I got to spend $14.95 for 24 hours of access. Um, but anyway, back then there was so much to learn. I mean, it was like, it was the beginning of, of what we're doing today. There was so much to learn and there really was no place for people to go and do that um, until DEF CON. And at DEF CON you can actually meet people that are coming up with a cool hacks and, you know, you're going to see some, some amazing stuff here today. Um, and you can actually build relationships with, this pe with, with these people. It's a place where um, you could begin to build trust. And really our community, the security community, exists because of the trust that we have uh, with each other. Um, the other thing, there were no security jobs. I mean, there were, no, there were uh, virtually no jobs in the security business at, back in 1992. Um, so if you think about that for a second, 20 years ago, the jobs that most of us have now didn't even exist. I know that there was no CIS CISO or CSO jobs. 
uh, maybe CSO jobs, so the physical side. Um, but back in, I was actually, I was in grad school in 1993 in one of my classes. We, uh, we were, got to play with a, a beta version of this browser thing called Mosaic. And I can remember thinking at the time that this is absolutely the coolest thing in the world. This is going to change the world. And uh, I mean, at the, think about it, there was, the browser was a new term. Um, and there was no World Wide Web. Google wasn't around. So for us in the security community at the time, if you, if you needed something, if you needed to find out about something, you needed to research something, you needed to talk to somebody about something, you couldn't just go and, and do a search and find it. You actually, you had to know somebody. You had to know somebody who knew somebody. Um, so DEF CON opened the door for us to meet people that we'd normally never get a chance to talk to. Science and scientists and government uh, technologists, researchers, vendors, publishers. Um, so it really kind of opened the window for, you know, for the community that we have today. Um, so you're probably wondering, what the heck does all this have to do with Homeland Security and the Christopher Columbus rule? A, a couple of people asked me that over the last couple of days. What, what is this Chris, Christopher Columbus rule you're talking about? Well, the, uh, the deputy secretary at DHS is probably one of the smartest people in the world that I know. I mean, she's absolutely brilliant. But uh, she, what she calls the Christopher, Christopher Columbus rule is this. Never fail to distinguish what's new from what's new to you. So what I want to talk about today are some of the things that DHS is doing that are contrary to what I think people typically think about the government and really specifically the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the government has become very good over the years at dealing with and responding to incidents in the physical world, but the cyber world, especially over the last couple of years, has really caused us to rethink and, re and react differently um, to a variety of different things. And as my friend Tom Kellerman, many of you know Tom, he's with uh, Trend Micro now, uh, was recently quoted in an article saying that now anyone can download a cyber Kalishnikov, cyber Kalishnikov, a cyber getaway car, and a cyber grenade. It's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool statement. Um, so one thing I want to tell you up front is that I don't think I'm smarter than you, and I don't think the government is smarter than you. Um, I don't think that I understand your business or your company better than you do. Um, and that's kind of a, I, I get that a lot from people as I go around, that people seem to think that, uh, that, that that we do think we're smarter than the private sector. And I can tell you from, from my perspective, having, I've been at DHS for about seven months now, um, and I came from the private sector. I certainly don't think that the government is smarter than, uh, than, than all you all and what you guys are doing in your, in your own organizations. Um, so the mission of DHS is, is to ensure a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. It always sounds to me like if any of you are old enough to remember the, uh, the Superman show that used to come on every afternoon that started it with truth, justice, and the American way. It always reminds me of that. But I can tell you that um, employees at the Department of Homeland Security, at least within our organization, go to work every day thinking about that mission statement. So while the government isn't historically known for innovation or thinking outside the box, um, that's changed a lot. Um, really over the years, but a lot over the past year um, at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, specifically, I think uh, the way we've been driven to approach cybersecurity has caused us to be more flexible um, and as we develop and implement new uh, security solutions and services. Um, we're hiring a lot of people from the private sector and, that are bringing new concepts of thinking. Um, as I said, I've been there for seven months now, and I've been purposefully very specifically, targetedly hiring people that have a reputation for thinking outside the box, for thinking the way that government folks don't normally tend to think. Now, I can tell you it's a little, been a little bit unsettling for, um, for a lot of people at DHS and in the government, but um, the 21st century is a terrible time to be a control freak in my mind. Um, in fact, uh, Secretary Napolitano appointed Jeff Moss to the Homeland Security Advisory Council a couple of years ago, there were a lot of eyebrows raised in the, uh, in the hacker community, especially here at DEF CON. I know Jeff took a lot of grief for that um, initially. But 
I can tell you he's been uh, center stage on a lot of initiatives in the government and really helping us push the envelope and think differently. Um, and the secretary recently appointed Jeff to a, uh, a task force on looking at workforce, at cyber workforce issues at DHS, which I hope that we will then um, turn around and, and apply more broadly to the rest of government and even to the private sector. Um, I have never asked Jeff this question directly, but um, uh, I would almost guarantee you that 10 years ago, if you had asked Jeff, if he was, uh, that, or you would have asked him if he thought he would be working this closely with the government, um, that probably would have been uh, pretty interesting to see his response. So anyway, I'm here today representing the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, because I want to tell you about some of the things that we're doing, but more importantly, uh, some of the things I think that we have in common, and I also want to challenge you with a few things as, we, uh, as I wrap uh, my little talk up here. So you're all here at DEF CON to learn about new technologies, new techniques, and new opportunities. And no matter what your motivation is for what you do, whether it's looking for zero days, writing new apps, or just wanting to learn how to run your organization better, um, ultimately I think, or at least I hope, that we're here because we care about national security and we care about security within our organizations, which contribute to national security in a large measure. Um, I can't legitimately call myself a hacker these days, but I have spent all of my adult life in this business. And, um, and so I, the one thing I hope is that we do have a common concern for the safety of our nation. Um, the United States is both a cyber power and a cyber target. And, uh, General Alexander from uh, NSA is speaking, in, I think, at noon today, and I encourage you to go hear him because I think he'll talk a lot more about that. Um, the critical infrastructure our society depends on every day relies on technology and is also the very uh, increasingly dependent upon cybersecurity. Those of you that were over at uh, Black Hat, uh, Sean Henry, formerly of the FBI, uh, gave the keynote um, on Wednesday and uh, talked a lot about that. In fact, you can read, Sean talks about it a lot in the media and been some pretty interesting discussions that he's, uh, that he's started. Um, but our economic vitality as a nation is really dependent upon the critical infrastructure for things we need like our communications, our transportation, electricity, water, you know, all of those critical infrastructure things are, are dependent upon the technology and the cybersecurity, the, the security that underpins all of that. Um, defending our critical infrastructures that support our businesses and government requires innovation and bold thinking. And that's what everyone in this room has the power to get involved with. Partnerships, collaboration, and information sharing are essential to cybersecurity. The more partners we have, the better protected and the less vulnerable we all are. No one, no one company, no one country, no one government, no one organization can do it all. Um, I still think there's a bit of a perception, slowly changing, I think, but there's a bit of a perception that the government is clueless about cybersecurity. And I can tell you that is, um, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, so while there's certainly some government organizations and private sector organizations that are more mature than others, um, that we're also pretty technically advanced in a lot of ways, and we have a lot of really smart people um, doing some fairly advanced work in a lot of areas. Um, so th really that's what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about is, is, are those issues. So we have three primary cyber responsibilities for the nation at the Department of Homeland Security. We secure the .gov environment for the federal civilian uh, departments. We help the private sector secure their networks primarily in the critical infrastructure areas. And then we also lead and coordinate responses to national cyber uh, events that rise to uh, some national significance. And uh, in 2011, U.S. CERT received over 106,000 incident reports from government and private sector organizations around the country. Uh, they also issued more than 5,200 alerts and advisories. So if you do the math, that's almost 300 incident reports and 14 alerts and advisories every single day of the year last year. And I can tell you right now we're on a, uh, we're, we're going to do more than that this year. Um, our industrial control system CERT uh, conducted 78 on-site assessments of uh, civilian control system entities last year and worked with the, uh, those organizations uh, providing them recommendations with how they could uh, improve their security posture. Uh, 
Uh, the ICS cert also distributed more than 1,100 copies of our CSET tool, uh, and we conducted more than 40 industrial control system training sessions, uh, both at our facility in Idaho Falls and um, on our road shows around the country. Has anyone, I can't see, but, um, so I won't ask the question, I guess. Uh, the um, industrial control systems facility in Idaho Falls, uh, I encourage you to check that out. It's a, it's something that anyone can participate in. Uh, and I've seen different training facilities um, around the world where we do, where people do a variety of different things. And I tell you, the, uh, the, the facility we have in Idaho Falls is, is absolutely the best industrial control system training, cybersecurity training facility in the world. Um, and uh, I encourage you, if you haven't been to it, and you can, can get, on the, uh, get on the schedule and attend that training, well worthwhile, and it's free, by the way. Um, you just pay your, pay your freight to get there and, and while you're there. Um, really a great program. Uh, we pay particular attention at DHS to industrial control systems. It's kind of one of my passions, having come from the, uh, the electricity industry uh, before uh, NERC, or before uh, I came to DHS, I was the, uh, the chief security officer at the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And I worked with about 5,000, I worked with all of the electric utilities across North America, that's the U.S. and Canada, and even a couple in uh, Mexico, um, on working with them on uh, ensuring that they were um, at least taking uh, advantage of what we had to offer at, at NERC uh, with respect to cybersecurity across their uh, control system environments. Um, <clears throat> we also operate the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, or NCIC, uh, which really is the nexus of cybersecurity information sharing in the federal government and increasingly with the private sector. We have, uh, it's a 24-7 operations and we have um, people in there from, from uh, all over the public and private sector. Uh, the various um, ISACs, the financial services, electric sector, IT sector, ISACs are represented on our watch floor. Um, <clears throat> we have different federal government agencies represented there. We have the FBI, Secret Service, um, Coast Guard. Uh, we have a, a, a number of different organizations out there. And I can tell you, anyone who's ever worked in an operations center, it's the informal relationships that matter more than the formal relationships. And out there, when you have a, somebody from the Coast Guard or somebody from the Secret Service sitting next to somebody from a bank or um, somebody working in the financial sector, and they see different events within their sector, they're getting different reports from different companies um, on different security related events or incidents that are happening. And you start seeing the, the magic that happens with that information sharing and how and it really grows across the watch floor. And we're able to get a, a, a much better um, operational picture of what's happening across the nation actually. Uh, in combating cybercrime, we work closely with the Secret Service, Immigration and Customs, the FBI, and uh, really any other uh, law enforcement organization in the country, both at the federal level as well as the state local level too. Um, so not only do we have a lot of exciting and important work going on in our operations, we participate in a lot of uh, pretty advanced uh, research uh, out of our um, R&D department in the Science and Technology Directorate at DHS. Um, they sponsor a number of projects that have resulted in new technology and they continue to drive new initiatives. Um, way back in 2003 when the, uh, the President released the National Strategy to Secure Cyberspace, the report called out and said that DNS and BGP were two of the protocols that were actually most vulnerable and need mo needed the most attention. Um, so while I think everyone agrees that, uh, that this is pretty important for the overall internet security, there wasn't a lot of commercial advantage for a company taking up that banner. So, um, so it, really that was a, an appropriate role for the government to step in and uh, invest the time and money in to begin maturing the security of those protocols. So um, DHS provided a lot of funding and leadership. Uh, and D Dr. Doug Mon is one of our, uh, actually he runs the R&D department at DHS. And really, he is a, uh, he's a great guy, but he's, he's been very vocal and forceful about pushing uh, on some things that, are, that we all, we in the security business, think are really important. He really pushed hard on DNS and 
And DHS was one of the organizations, I'm not saying the only one, but it was one of the organizations that really pushed hard in getting DNSSEC rolled out. So now DNSSEC, as you, as you know, is rolling out across all of the, the different top-level domains in over 70 countries have uh, have their top-level domains already signed uh, with DNSSEC. Uh, we're also providing funding for the development and deployment of BGPSEC. And as you probably know, the uh, protocol modifications are currently going through the ITF standards process now. And I just talked with Doug a couple days ago, and he told me that they're also providing funding for development of uh, routing public key infrastructure, RPKI, uh, which provides signatures um, on address blocks provided by re uh, to registries and ISPs. So that's just kind of a, a little tip of, of what we're doing. You know, we're, we're certainly not a, uh, we're not a, an incutel like of an organization. We're not, uh, although we do provide funding to, to some startups uh, that have some promise for things that we look, that look for that could um, develop uh, into something that more broadly is transferable to the, private, to the government and the private sector. Um, there's just a, there's a lot of interesting things going, a lot of great uh, opportunities within DHS to get involved with some of those things. So what else are we doing? I'm keyed on three prime areas that I believe we need to stay focused on to make the nation stronger. And these include three things. Building a world-class workforce for DHS and the nation, strengthening partnerships across the government and private sector, and achieving operational excellence. So building our world-class workforce. Over the past 20 years, um, anybody that's been in this business for that long <clears throat> knows that we've constantly reinvented ourselves. I mean, the things change so rapidly. I mean, the things that I worry about today as a, you know, as a security professional are not the things I worried about a year ago. I mean, the, the threats, they're different. The vulnerabilities are different. They're, they've changed. And, and, you know, my experience tells me that the things I'm worried about today are not going to be the things that I'm worried about 12 months from now. Um, so e even at DHS, we've had to evolve. You know, the, uh, following uh, the 9-11 disaster, the Congress decided that we needed a, an organization that was focused on homeland security. So we had got the Department of Homeland Security. But that, the department is really a, an aggregation of uh, about two dozen different departments and agencies. So there's a, you can imagine there's a lot of growing pains that go along with aggregating um, those many, those di different kinds of organizations, some of which have been around for a long time. You know, the Secret Service and the Coast Guard, those are very um, legacy-driven legacy organizations, and bringing them into one very, very large organization um, has been some challenges. Uh, but, uh, I mean, DHS, we're, our organization, we're about 240,000 people um, uh, across the globe, really. Um, four years ago in my organization today, we had about 40 people. Um, today we have close to 400 people doing everything from running the NKIC, running U.S. CERT, running ICS CERT, to doing our national education, uh, uh, training, education training programs and our national uh, cybersecurity awareness programs. So we really do a lot. Um, it, we don't just do operations. We do um, part of our mission, part of my mission, is to go out and spread the gospel. Um, and, uh, you know, talking to a group like uh, an audience like you today is different than talking to an auditorium full of uh, people in, you know, in, in a town or in a, in a, at a university somewhere. The level of awareness of the threat and the vulnerabilities that we deal with on a daily basis, simply not there. So it's a big deal for us. Um, big part of our mission is to go out and spread that gospel um, across the nation. Um, so just like you and your jobs, our workload continues to grow, which means we have to have better trained people all the time. So I can't see your hands, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Um, how many people have all of the cybersecurity talent? Oh, thank you. Wow, magic. Um, how many people have all of the cybersecurity talent in your companies or your organizations that you want and you, that you think you need? No one. So that means there's not enough cybersecurity talent in the world today. Well, I agree with that. Um, and what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about the, the uber talented people, I mean the, the, the ninja type people 
that um, the kind of people that if you had 10 or 15 or 20 of them or a room like this, I could rule the world. Um, most companies don't have that. You know, um, coming from, from the private sector and working with electric utilities across the nation, uh, there's, you know, there's probably 20 really large um, electric companies in the country, but there are, uh, there's 4,800 or so that are not very large. And I can tell you, a lot of those companies are clueless. They're absolutely clueless. Um, so we, we as a community, have to figure out how we can raise the bar for everyone. Um, so we have a problem, and that problem is that we don't have enough of those uber-talented people um, to protect our private sector companies, our government, um, or in our critical infrastructures. And those are the people we depend on. You know, you guys are the people that we depend on the nation depends on. Um, identifying, cultivating, and creating the next generation of cybersecurity professionals is critical to our economic vi viability and the security of the nation, um, of our society, actually. I don't think that's hyperbole, and, and I really can't overemphasize how important that is. Uh, I was in uh, Mountain View a couple of weeks ago. Um, I go out and talk to, to companies and talk to startups every now and then and see what kind of things they're working on, if, things, if they're things that, we are, that are translatable or transferable um, back into the government, or if they're things that I think have uh, potential um, as that next big thing. And uh, I was talking with one company, a small company, there were uh, 77 people in the company. Really cool product. Um, and they've grown from four people to 77 people in about four years. So. That's a great, that's a success. Um, the bad part about it is they have 55 open, 55 vacancies in the company that they can't find the talented people for. Um, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, I was talking with someone last night from a very large company and he said they, it, it, that is their number one problem is finding the really talented people to come in. And it takes so long. He said it took 18 months for them once they identified somebody to get them in the company. So I, that may be a different kind of a problem. Um, that sounds like a federal government bureaucracy problem to me. But, um, but so this is a big deal. It's something that we, I think, as a community need to, um, to, to be more concerned about. Um, so I believe our first step to solve the problem is a cultural one. Uh, we need to make people want to choose cybersecurity as a career. You need, we need, I don't think we'll ever get to a place where kids say, you know, I'd rather be a geek than be a cowboy or be a race car driver or something like that. But, but we need to make them aware that it is an option. I cannot tell you how many, you know, as I go around and talk to schools, um, both at the grade school and high school and at the university level, um, people simply do not know that you can actually have a career doing this. Hey, I was talking to three high school kids last week, um, and when I said, hey, you know, there are people that want to hire you. You finish your, finish your education, there are people that want to hire you. And they were, uh, they were pretty blown away by it. Um, but, I, but that's good. I mean, so, so we just have to, we have to get better. We, the government and the private sector, have to work together on changing that per public perception, figure out how we can actually make it cool. You know, it's... It's cool when you're here at DEF CON and you're hanging around with, with you know, people that think alike, but you, know, you go back out and you're one person in a sea of humanity um, that don't always think the same way. Um, so DHS is taking active measures to cultivate the next uh, generation of cybersecurity professionals. And we do a number of things. I'm gonna run through a couple of the different programs that, we, uh, that we're involved with. Um, we have a partnership with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in a nationally coordinated effort focused on cybersecurity awareness, education, training, and professional development. It's called the, it's called the NICE program. I hate that term. I wish I'd have been around when they were naming that. I would have named it something other than NICE. Anyway, NICE stands for National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. We also have a partnership with uh, General Alexander's team at. Uh, at the National Security Agency for the National Centers for Cyber S National Centers for Academic Excellence um, by promoting uh, higher education and producing graduates 
uh, with cybersecurity expertise at 145 different universities and colleges across the country. Uh, we also have a partnership with the National Sci Science Foundation called uh, Scholarship for Service Program that offers scholarships for two years and then you pay back uh, two years of service in a, a federal government agency. Um, and I really like that program. I actually like all those programs because it's kind of a win-win. You know, we're, we're increasing the talent pool in the country. Uh, we're floating the boat a little bit higher, but we get first crack at, at hiring some of these people back into the government. Um, DHS is also a sponsor of the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Um, and actually, we spo help sponsor, we co-sponsor a number of other cyber challenge events. Uh, I attended the, um, the championship uh, for the, that National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition um, a couple months ago. It was in San Antonio. And um, I, I tell people all the time, if you're not going there and recruiting, you're missing an incredible opportunity. There are some really bright kids that are coming out of college, and I'm telling you, um, the last night of the event, they hold a kind of a social, and um, these kids are rock stars. I mean, there are big companies that are vying for these, you know, 20-year-old kids' attention uh, because they are really looking to hire them. Two years ago, Boeing was there, and Boeing hired all eight of the, the guys on the winning team right there. Um, so a great, a great recruiting opportunity, and I, I really encourage people to go do that. Um, so I talked about some of the college programs, um, and I think they're, they're really important, but I don't want to be misunderstood about something. Um, some of the best security people I know, some of the most brilliant minds I know in our business, never went to college. So. So I think that's lost. You know, a lot of times we focus on going to college and, cre and, and, and these academic programs at universities and colleges. I don't want to miss, I, you know, not everybody has to go to college. You know, those great people that I talked about, they spent those four years with hands-on keyboards, spending 20 hours a day hacking, thinking, learning, talking to other people. So. I, I'm not going to poo-poo uh, the, the college education because I, I really do think it's important. But it's not the most important thing. And, and we can't, you know, I've been to in, in a couple of organizations where HR didn't want to hire people if they didn't have a college degree. And I've fought that battle for the past 20 years. And I think we all need to recognize that um, because it, it is a big deal. You know, I know that there's probably a lot of you out there that don't have a degree that are a hell of a lot smarter than I am in this business. You know, and if you are, come and see me because I want to hire you. Um, so, one of my loftier goals at DHS is to actually make it a stop on somebody's career path. Uh, now, I'm not naive enough to believe that, you know, that everybody in here is going to want to run and jump and come and join work for the government. Uh, but I'll say, we have some pretty cool opportunities in the government. We have some, a very cool mission, you know, to protect the nation. We have cool tools. Um, so it, it, it's not that, that I, it's not that every, it's a, it, that is a, a career choice for everybody, but you know what? Come and work for the government for a couple of years, two years, three years. Get some experience, especially if you're, you're, you're new in the game. It, it looks great on a resume, and it gives you the kind of experience that allow you to go back, uh, to go out and, and, and compete a little bit better in the, in the broader community. So, I've talked to, we, so while we're hiring great people at DHS, just like many of you, keeping those people is a, is a challenge um, sometimes. I mean, as I just mentioned, and I encourage this, by the way. It mentions somebody come and work for the government for two or three years, and then they go off and do something else. But of course, somebody works for you for two or three years, they're just getting competent enough where you can have them go and do other things. And that's when you know, other people are coming in with offering better money or, or a new challenge. So we have to do that too. I mean, we have to, and we think very, very um, specifically about this, about how do we retain, how do we train and retain the people we have, and we have a couple of programs 
um, that, that we focus on, certainly with our entry level training. We bring somebody in, you know, they get the same kind of uh, basic training that probably most of you provide your new employees. Uh, we really focus on that, try to uh, create that culture where they realize that we value that. Um, and then we have cyber rotations where we actually rotate people, give them the opportunity after they've been there a while to go and work in other parts of DHS. And as you can imagine, I mentioned earlier, you, know, you can go work in the Coast Guard, you can go work in the, in the Secret Service, um, you can go work in, uh, in the Secret Service has a, a National Forensics Laboratory, great place to go. We, we have a, a malware lab within the U.S. CERT organization. It's another great place to go and, and get some different experience. So, those guys look like they have guns. Oh, no. They're not cops. Um, so, you know, so th these, these rotational assignments are really, really important for us. And they broaden the experience. And then when they come back to the organization, um, they're, they're much more valuable to, 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 to all of us. Uh, we also do formal mentoring where actually, you, you know, somebody can say, um, buddy them up with, with somebody that does have more experience and they actually spend a year or two getting, being formally mentored. And then we have a master's level program where people um, take classes um, uh, remotely from the Naval Postgraduate School and they end up getting a master's degree in, uh, in cybersecurity from NPS, my alma mater by the way. Um, so we have a variety of missions at DHS and in case you didn't pick up on it, I'm trying to convince you that DHS is a cool place to work. Um, so my second goal is strengthening partnerships across government and the private sector. Um, information sharing and public-private partnerships are things we've heard about for a long time and they're critical to our success, but we really have to work together on this. Um, the private sector owns and operates roughly 85% of the nation's critical infrastructure, so collaboration is really important and partnerships are even more important uh, because they add a lot of value. They're, they they help us with, they're, you know, they're effective force multiplier. Um, they're essential components to building awareness and education uh, with our stakeholders. As I mentioned earlier, those circles of trust might be the most important component of our business. Socrates said, the way to gain a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. Uh, I said this at Black Hat yesterday. I think I might be the first guy to quote Socrates at DEF CON. Um, I think this describes the trust model pretty well and it's in, because it's in, in our business it's all about having credibility, um, not being a poser. Uh, so we all know that partnerships are important. It's my job to make sure that DHS continues to strengthen them, build trusted relationships and cult cultivate them that result in uh, valuable information sharing across the government and the private sector. So my third goal is achieving operational excellence. Um, there are threats everywhere and we all see them. Mine may be different than yours, but um, they probably overlap in a lot of uh, respects. But my goal is to make DHS continue to be the lead for security in the federal government. I also want us to be the key organization the private sector looks for to help in securing the critical infrastructure. And the NCIC is really that place where we're seeing that now. Um, the, the call volume and interaction with the private sector and the, and the NCIC is going through the roof. Uh, people are beginning to realize that there's a lot of value in communicating with, uh, with DHS from a threat and vulnerability perspective because we have a lot of information. You know, as we, as we gather information from one company, we share that out broadly. And when you, you, know, you extrapolate that across the, the entire nation, that's what results in all of those alerts and advisories. Um, So not only are we looking to hire the best people we can find and build a great talent pool, uh, we're also developing and implementing some of the very best products and services available. Um, we're also focused on streamlining our operational areas so that efficiency and consistency are embedded in everything we do. Um, so you've heard that story. And I, I, this is kind of the way I've, I've, I've worked in building the security programs in the different organizations I've been. The story of you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your buddy. Well, you know, we ought to all be building our security programs kind of with that in mind. We put, build the bar higher, high enough so that we become too much of a challenge and, you know, bad guys go somewhere else. They go where, you know, your, the buddies aren't running fast enough. 
Um, and we as a nation need to be thinking about that. And going back to my first comment about we're both a cyber power and a, and a cyber target. I'd rather be a target of opportunity any day than a target of choice, by the way. Um, so I'd like to leave you with three challenges. Um, and these are things that will help us in our defense of the nation, but also help you and your companies. First off, continue talking about cybersecurity to everybody you can. And I know it's, it's a bit of a cliche, um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, it, it, and, and you guys know this too, you get out in different communities, you get in different areas and groups, and people are clueless about what we do. Um, absolutely clueless about the threats that we face and the, the, the impact that it could have on their life and on our society. Um, you guys are the champions, so you know, we really need, we, we the nation need everybody in here um, to raise the awareness level. Go out and speak at a, at a, at a school, at a grammar school or high school. Uh, get involved with a program um, at, at a school. I was at, uh, at Cal Poly Pomona last week. They held a, a cyber camp. They hold a cyber camp every year. Um, Dr. Dan Manson, he's here somewhere. Um, this guy is a national treasure. Um, truly, truly, what he does at Cal Poly Pomona is, um, is phenomenal. The, if, for those of you that don't know, a polytechnical university is different than a regular university. Their motto is they learn by doing. So they, you go through four years of, of, of classes at, at a polytech, um, but each one of the classes has a lab. So you actually, I mean, you have hands-on experience with everything you do. And at, at Cal Poly Pomona, they have really built one of the, I think, one of the premier um, cybersecurity programs in the nation. Um, anyway, at, at the uh, at last week at the cyber camp, 37 people participated in a week of training, and then they had a CTF event at the end of the week. Um, and so it, it was it was just watching these, and some of them were were like. I don't know, 16 years old they look like, and they actually had a, a 60 year old dude in there um, too in the program, but I mean it just kind of shows you the range of the people that, that are getting involved with some of these things. So we are, we are sponsoring a number of these different programs, and um, does anyone know Alex Levinson? Alex here? Eric Cornelius? Eric better be here. Um, well, Alex, both Alex and Eric were, they were parts of these programs a couple of years ago. Alex is now a senior um, security engineer at Zynga, um, you know, one of the uh, great uh, gaming companies up in San Francisco. Um, Eric is, a, he works for us at DHS, he's an industrial control system uh, security guy. Probably um, m one of the most elite uh, uh, security guys in the industrial control system, system space in the entire world. Um, but I think that speaks to the, you know, the, the quality of these programs that are turning out people like that. Um, I was actually talking with a guy from Rackspace yesterday and they actually sponsor some programs too uh, at, the, at the university level um, uh, where they're, they're working with, the, with universities, uh, with people at the university on these kind of things just kind of after school programs, if, if you would. Um, so these are the kind of programs that, that we as a nation, we need your companies to support. Get involved with some of these things. Uh, the second challenge is to do whatever you can to make security less complicated and confusing for the average user. We've been saying it for years, but complexity is the enemy of good security. Um, <clears throat> we need to con continue getting better about building security in so there's less bolting on later. Um, I'm going to tell Scott Charney story. Many of you guys have probably heard, some of you have heard Scott talk about this. Scott Charney is the uh, Vice President of Trustworthy Computing at uh, Microsoft. He tells this great story that he has a four-year-old son and an 80-year-old mother, and he has the same problem with both of them. Um, his four-year-old son will be on the computer, and he'll get a pop-up, and his son just clicks right through it and goes on because he can't read. His 80-year-old mother, who, by the way, has a PhD, she'd be on her computer, and, uh, and she'll get a pop-up and she clicks through because she doesn't understand what it means. So we have to get better. We as a community have to get better, especially if you're developing programs uh, or you're writing code. We have to get better about building security in and making it easier uh, for the average consumer to understand this. I told this story yesterday. I always talk to my dad on the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday. Um, and so if, you know, if I see his, his phone number pop up on my phone, 
on Saturday, Sunday, it's not a big deal. I know it's dad who wants to chat for a little bit. But if I ever get a call during the week on a Monday night or a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, I always know he's got some kind of computer problem. He's got some, and I always tell him, I said, dad, don't click on anything. If you get a pop-up, call me. And so I get these late night calls. Uh, and he says, okay, I have this pop-up and he's trying to explain it to me. And like, um, we, have, we have to make it, uh, it easier for, for consumers to deal with this kind of stuff. So I want to talk about open source just one for one second. I'm a believer in open source. I know that um, for some people they think that uh, um, the government is opposed to open source. I'm trying to change that, uh, at least at DHS. I think open source has a lot of value. I, I mean, from the very beginning I've loved open source technology because it's kind of, it's, it's like evolution. If you're good, you live. If you're bad, you die. Um, and we all have a part in making that, you know, making some of those decisions. And I think open source has a lot of, pro has a lot of value in helping um, make it, help making things uh, easier for that consumer. Um, so it's said that you can recover from a poor decision, but you can't recover from indecision. So my last challenge to you is to execute. Um, use your talents for good and not evil. Be part of the solution, don't be part of the problem. Um, do something good for your country. Because I can tell you, we as a community have a lot of value to the country. We can do a lot of really good things, but we, really, but we need to focus on doing those good things. Take your ideas and innovations and do something positive. Uh, Tony Sager, many of you know Tony, he recently retired from the, uh, the 25 or 30 years or 40 years forever uh, at the National Security Agency. Tony's absolutely one of the most brilliant people in the world. Uh, and he's so plain spoken and just, I mean, he gets it and he, know, he knows how to take the most complex thing and turn it into something simple. Tony says, automate everything you can and when you get done, figure out, figure out how to automate everything else so that we can save humans for work worthy of humans. You know, there's something profound in that, I think. Um, and Rich Betlick, Rich is the CSO at, at Mandiant. Um, he said last week, or actually a couple months ago, was quoted as saying, the average cyber espionage attack goes on for 416 days before the average company discovers it's been hacked. We have to get better at executing to change that. We as a community have to get better at executing. 416 days, and, and you know, he, that's hard facts. That's not just hyperbole. That's not just made up numbers. They know that. We have to get better, and it's our job, it's all of our job, to get better executing to mitigate those kinds of, of things. So that's it. And I'm out of time. Um, that's all right. You can rush me out of here now. But anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy DEF CON. This is awesome. 20 years.